Hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Sharon Bornholt, and I'm so happy you're tuning in today. Real estate investors are often asked to give a presentation, and that can be for a number of reasons. They may be asked to speak in person at their local RIA meeting, their real estate investors meeting, or possibly to an online uh, group of investors that could be located anywhere in the U.S. or even in another country. However, one of the most important times a real estate investor needs to know how to communicate effectively is when they are meeting with a private money lender. The person you're asking to put their trust in you by loaning you money isn't likely to do that if you can't clearly communicate the opportunity for them. So they want to know what's in it for them. This can quickly become a trust issue with that potential lender if you don't nail this presentation. But if you think about it in this business, you are giving a type of a presentation every time you talk to a motivated seller. My guest today is Brendan, who is the founder of Master Talk, and Brendan is an expert on this topic. He coaches ambitious executives and entrepreneurs on how to become the top 1% communicators in their industry. He also has a popular YouTube channel called Master Talk, which you should definitely check out. And I did that myself. I'm excited to have Brendan on the show for a number of reasons, but the most important one is that we all need to be better at giving a talk or a presentation, whether that's to one person or to a group. Welcome to the show, Brendan. Aaron, the pleasure is absolutely mine. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, I have to start off with this question. Brendan, did you just wake up one day and decide this is what you're going to do? And in some ways, Sharon, the answer to that question is probably yes. And I'll tell you why. Oh. You know, when I was in college, I went to business school. And funny enough, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in accounting. So I thought I was going to be a numbers guy my whole life. But then as I got older, I started competing in case competition, Sharon. Think of it like professional sports, but mm -hmm. for nerds. So <laughs> other guys my age were playing football or rugby or baseball or basketball or some other sport you probably wouldn't see me playing, honestly. Mm -hmm. I did presentations competitively, and that's how I learned how to speak. But then as I got older, I started coaching a bunch of students on how to communicate, not because I was a great coach, but because they didn't have a great alternative to me. And I accidentally developed a gift in coaching other people on how to speak. So then after I graduated and I worked as a technology consultant at IBM, I had the idea for Master Talk because I was thinking to myself, hmm, you know, all this information that I'm sharing with all these 50 people I had coached in college isn't really available for free on the internet. Mm -hmm. So I start making videos and then a few years later it turned into something I never could have imagined. I, I love the title, first of all, of Master Talk. I think that's a great title and I can actually imagine you doing that in college. I think that is really cool. Um, how do you how do you get rid of bad habits like when you're speaking? I want to talk about that just a little bit. How do you get rid of the ums and the ahs and the you knows and I call them filler words. For sure, Sharon. You know, for me, the conversations always begins with the vision right? Because there's two parts. One is the tactical answer to that question, which we will definitely dive into, which is simply to replace the ums and ahs with pausing. But the other piece is why does this really matter to investors? And for me, the game has always been you're leaving money on the table. If you go in front of a, a hard money lender or in a different stakeholder, you're trying to raise capital, and they ask you a really hard hitting question about the deal that you're trying to raise capital for, and you answer like this, uh, uh, I don't really know, Sharon. Mm -hmm. You're actually telling us a lot of things indirectly. The first thing you're telling us is not only will this person never find the answer, I'm not trusting this person with capital. They look like they're inexperienced. They don't look like they have any credibility. Mm -hmm. That's the first thought. And the second thought is the next person who walks in who doesn't make those mistakes will probably get the money. And I'll even give you a third one. The investing community, Sharon, is a lot smaller than people think. So if you mess up a few meetings, the whole industry will know about it, or at least the industry in the state you're living in. So that's why it's so important for us to get rid of them. So now the last piece on this is going back to the tactics. How do we get rid of the ums and ahs? The way that we do this is by understanding why we see them in the first place, which is to buy ourselves time. 
So you ask me a question, you go, hey, Brendan, uh, you know, tell me your story. And I go, uh, uh, you know, Sharon, uh, this is my story. So I use ums and ahs to buy time, whereas the best speakers on the planet, they just use nothing to buy time. So just learn to pause for a few seconds to get rid of them. That is so brilliant because I think when you are presenting, you feel like you have to keep the flow going. When I learned uh, over time, those pauses are really important. And rather than saying the ums or the ahs, which is a habit, once you get into the habit, it's a habit you have to break. I think it is a, it can be a habit. But I love your analogy there that you use with the private money lenders because 100%. If you cannot show up as a confident person, and a lot of that, I think, has to do with your posture, not only the words that come out of your mouth, your posture, the confidence that you are able to portray, then you can give an, an effective presentation. But you have to have all the pieces, which is sometimes hard for people to put together. Exactly right. Let's talk a little bit about... Um, Let's say you seem to know a little bit about the investing world. So I'll just go with this. When an investor is talking to a motivated seller and they do that, they face the same problem, the ums and the ahs and the kind of stammering and not giving the answer. When in reality, they know the answer in almost every case. But they're, like you said, they're trying to buy some time, I guess, to formulate whatever they're going to say in their mind. So how, reflecting that back to the average investor that is speaking to a single motivated seller, they want to purchase that property. Um, maybe it's a house. It could be a small apartment building, but sing, a, what we call a single family uh, residence. How do they become better at that? For sure, Sharon. Fantastic question. So there's different parts to that answer. The first one, the first gap that I've seen with a lot of my real estate clients is the art of practicing the simple idea of how do I think more quickly on my feet? That's the first thing to practice. And the solution to that is very simple, actually. It, does, it has actually very little to do with real estate. It's to practice a question, uh, uh, an exercise rather, called the random word exercise. So you pick a word like light bulb or home or destiny, something that has absolutely nothing to do with real <laughs> estate. And you create 60 second presentations on the spot out of thin air. And this gets people really uncomfortable because they want to buy time. They go, uh, 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 right away. And I go, no, you have to start right away. The presentation, as soon as I give you the word, you begin the exercise. So the first 10 times a real estate investor or really anybody does this exercise, Sharon, it's really bad. They go, oh, you know, light bulb is, you know, something I put in my house. But if you did this 100 times, 100 times seems like a lot of time, Sharon, but it's not because the random word exercise takes 60 seconds to do which is five minutes a day to do it five times for three weeks. That's it. That's the first part of the game. The second part of the game is an exercise I teach a lot of investors called the question drill. Make a list of all of the questions you're getting asked right now that you're butchering because you already have the answer, but you're going, uh, 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 and literally take a step back. Take one of those questions every day and just go, how could I answer this perfectly right now? And just keep practicing that same question until you have it perfect. Then go to the next question, the next question. But if you're selling, if, if you're talking to sellers for single family and you're not, especially if you're not investing across multifamily or apartments or any other property, you get really good because the questions don't change. <laughs> it's the same questions and you get really good at them really fast. That, that's a great exercise. And I think of that like playing the piano when you have to sit down and play the same thing, the, the same, you know, little short thing over and over and over until it's imprinted in your brain and you no longer think about it. But I don't think most people have really talked or thought about putting that in the context of talking to a motivated seller. That's correct. And, and just to give context, you know, be a little vulnerable here, because I want to inspire people at the end of the day to do this. My first real estate podcast, I didn't have the industry expertise because I don't hold property. So the mm -hmm. first time, <laughs> the first podcast, I was on one of the biggest real estate shows in the world, Rod's podcast. And I was, I was on his show and he started asking me a bunch of questions about multifamily. And I just said, I don't know. 
So I started to ask, and then I just asked him at the end of the show, hey, why don't you educate me? Like, what, what's going on here? So then when I got on like Jake and Gino and a bunch of other real estate podcasts, I, I was a, a lot more proficient. So it's the same analogy here because I've done 20, 25 real estate podcasts, be, it, the same questions get asked over and over again. So now I'm able to adapt, but it wasn't the case at the beginning. So if I could do it, everybody who's listening to this podcast, Sharon, the only difference is nothing to do with talent. It has everything to do with there's not enough focus on this specific skill set. In the same way, let's say, an investor might spend a lot of time hiring real estate coaches and figure out property deals or hiring people to source deals to find the right home. They'll put a lot of attention to study the cap table, to make sure the ROI is there, to look at what the interest rate on the loan is, to make sure everything adds up. They won't apply that same level of granularity and intensity to that process in closing deals in the cycle to actually how to answer investor questions. If people just use the same focus, but with answering investor questions, they would get way better results over time. That is such valuable information. We spend so much time practicing different things. If you play on a softball team, you go to practice. Whatever you're doing, whether it would be speaking or playing the piano or playing a sport, you don't get better at it if you don't practice. But I have to say, I don't know of too many investors that spend a lot of time on that. I think maybe podcasters spend a little bit more time on that if, if they're investors, but not generally the investors so much. I know one thing that you talked about, which um, I liked is in the vein of presentations, all you had a lot of information about giving presentations. Oftentimes we get asked to present to um, the group, some of us will, and it might be four or 500 people, maybe more. Sometimes we'll get asked to, um, especially during COVID, a lot of those meetings turned to Zoom, which was a whole different skill set as far as you don't have the opportunity to get in front of an audience and engage them in the same way that you would um, if you were on a stage. But you talk, you mentioned for one thing, I wanted to talk, well, I want to talk about a couple of things. One is drawing your audience in so that they are excited after your talk. I want to talk about that. And it also weave in the goal of the talk, how that impacts that. Absolutely, Sharon. So let's tackle both of them individually. Let's start with the first one. What is the key outcome of your presentation? You know, for me, the definition of communication, the way I defined it anyways, is how do we convey an idea to achieve a specific outcome for a specific audience? Let me repeat that again. My definition of communication is how do we convey an idea in a way that achieves a specific outcome for a specific audience. And that could be a bunch of different things. That could be closing a real estate deal. That could be raising capital for a, for a bigger real estate fund. That could be convincing your significant other that we should have Chinese food tonight and not Mexican <laughs> food, right? Because all of them have an idea. All of them have an audience, that a specific one and a specific outcome, except this time it's convincing somebody else that we should have a different type of food. Mm -hmm. So it's a different level of stakes. But the principle is the same, which is if you don't take a step back and really just ask yourself, what is the outcome of today's meeting or what is my intention? It's going to be really hard to drive the actual result that you want. One of those examples in real estate could be if you're if you're asked to give a talk, the example you just gave, right, around four or 500 mm -hmm. people. Well, the intention is very different if your goal is to talk about, hey, this is how I grew my, my real estate agency from zero to 100 million, and I want to inspire all of you on that entrepreneurial journey. That's a very different intention than going, how do I show off my results in a way that helps me raise capital from the very audience that I'm standing in front mm -hmm. of? So if you want to raise you know, money, if you have like a really big real estate fund for let's say multi-year single family, and there's a lot of interested investors, you, don't, you can focus on the personal story. You should, but you should also talk about your track record. This is what we've been able to return for clients as the results, mm -hmm. whatever you know, is, is you're allowed to disclose. I know there's some parts you can't disclose in a fund, but as an example, and then you're able to drive a better outcome, which is, hey, people raise their hand and go, hey, maybe I should invest money with this person. And, and get results with them. So that's why it's important to take a step back and ask yourself about the outcome. 
the the second part really fast on engagement. I'll keep it really simple. One ball at a time, share. So for everybody listening to this right now, you have to ask yourself the number one question, which is why haven't I already booked 50 minutes in my calendar every day to do the random word exercise? We mm -hmm. got to start there. And then after we build the muscle over time, then we learn different ideas of how to engage audiences better. That leads to better outcomes in presentations. Okay, I want to circle back to the goal of the talk. Here's a situation. Sometimes people um, like me or other, other people in this business will get asked to speak on a topic at a conference. And because this conference is usually selling into their own program, maybe it's a high-level coaching or a membership or whatever it is, but a lot of times these two or three-day conferences they are, this is a setup for them to sell maybe, let's say they're high level coaching. Your speaker, therefore, should not ever pitch their products. You, you pitch your expertise, you, you teach whatever the topic is, and you tell them, you can, like you said, you can go back to this. These are the results I got by doing this, and I recommend you do it because, and you can go through that whole scenario. But how do you set yourself up to have them contact you? How do you have such a, I guess uh, you draw them in so much during your presentation that whatever happens with, they're going to sign up, we'll say they're going to sign up for the high level coaching here. But I want them next week or next month or the next time they think about probates, which is something I focus on. I want them to remember me. And I, I've had success with that, but I feel like I'm missing like the magic formula. So Brendan, is there a magic formula? <laughs> For sure, sure. <laughs> I, I love this because I really get asked this type of nuanced mm -hmm. question. So let me start mm -hmm. by saying you're absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of the times when you get asked to speak, which is a very advanced question, by the way, is when you get, at, when you get asked to speak, often there's a conflict of interest between you as the speaker and the conference organizer. So mm -hmm. the first question when, when I'm coaching a client on this specific thing has actually very little to do with techniques and presentations. Mm -hmm. It begins with, is this a good use of your time? Like you're obviously somebody who's really important in the space when I'm talking to somebody in that industry, like you or somebody else. Is this a good investment of time? And if and if it is, I want you to argue for it. Like, cause because it's not just three an hour you're speaking. You're flying into the conference, you're flying out of the conference, you're spending three. That's actually why I turn down a lot of in-person speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. A lot of because I just go, why would I waste three days if I can charge two thousand, three thousand dollars an hour to just give a virtual talk for 45 minutes and I'll still sign clients anyways? Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a good use case. That's the first thing. So I'm glad you're having me talk about this. Mm -hmm. The second piece is if we decide as a, as a, as a team that okay, this makes sense for us to to invest 72 hours out of let's say Sharon's schedule to be there. Now let's let's figure out what's in it for us, and that could be a bunch of different things. So then to your question, it creates a lot of nuance. So there's some conference organizers who are very open, who go like, okay, you know, Sharon, yes, we have a product to sell. Yes, this is, you know, this is where we're leading to, but we, we want you to have, you know, some space to do this, or they pay you a high fee. But if it's not either the two, then it's going to be hard to justify why we're there. And then the, the third part of the conversation is how do we create a talk that is so riveting that helps you stand out from everybody else? Mm -hmm. And 90% of that is really just about giving the best talk, right? right. It's like you just go there, you show up, you're the best, right? That's it. And, and that's what I'm constantly working on with my industry because nothing just beats being ex excellent at what you do like mm -hmm. you are in probates. But then the other 10% of that game is going... How do I get people to contact me at the end of the presentation? I'm not a world-class expert at this. There's a lot of people much better than me at that specific part of the game. I'm a lot better at the other 90%. But what I would say is, is a lot of speakers will use a variety of techniques. So one of them is to just text me at, at, at a specific number so you join their text campaign. That's one thing I've seen very well. The second thing that I use personally that's worked very, very well in our business is to get them to add me on one of the social medias where we can contact them directly, which in mm -hmm. our case is going to be LinkedIn and Instagram. So because my name is hard to spell, I'll usually just either go to LinkedIn or Instagram. So let's say I'll give you an example. I give a keynote last week to 100 people 
uh, virtually, so I didn't have to fly out for it, which works great for me. And then at the end, my funnel is just add me on LinkedIn, and then everyone adds me on LinkedIn, and then whoever does in three weeks, they they get a, a chat prompt that just says, hey, why don't mm -hmm. you come to my next free training? Then we capture their email that way. Mm -hmm. But there's different ways of, of skinning the cat, and there's people who have done it much better than me in the industry, for sure. I am able to um, put up my website. Um, I'm, you know, able to um, let them get a freebie. So that that works pretty well. And I have to say, this is this is a pretty good size conference, and they are a tight knit group of people that trust each other, and they refer well out of the group. So for me, it's always it's always a win. What I'm hearing from you is that I'm doing okay in this this arena because they do sign up for my uh they do sign up for my freebie which brings to mind i might need a new freebie within the next two weeks because people <laughs> come back they come back to this conference three times a year I, I see the same people in there there are always a lot of new people but they're the people that are in the high level coaching groups and they are part of this bigger core group of successful real estate investors and so they they return time and time again. But that's very interesting. And my take on this has always been to just go out there and do your best job. Give give a great presentation, which um, except for you, Brendan, let's be honest, we can all kind of improve on that. I'm sure we weren't all born with your gift of gab, although I'll say the man hosting a conference I'm going to uh, soon can talk for three days and barely look at his slides. So I do not have that level of a gift of gab and presentation skills. He's actually an excellent presenter. So, um, but that gives me some ideas here. Let's, you know, let, let me comment on that really quick. Yeah. You know, you know what I found really fascinating about the real estate industry, Sharon, that's really mm -hmm. shocked me is for people that are su su successful as you, we make up beliefs. And I've, I've met people who have, <laughs> I've, I've coached people in my career that I never thought I would have as clients, by the way, to be mm -hmm. open and vulnerable here, who manage like $200 million in properties. And, I, and I'm talking to them and they're looking at me and they're saying the same story that you're telling me, which is, mm -hmm. you know, Brent, you have this gift of gab. You're so talented <laughs> at what you do. And I'm looking at them as like, you hold $200 million in real estate property. I, th I think you could figure out this speaking thing. I got a crooked, <laughs> I got a crooked left arm. I was born in a city called Montreal, for those who don't know. You need to know how to speak French, which is a language I did not know. So my French, my parents sent me to French school, Sharon. So my whole life, not only did I struggle with speaking, I had to present in a language I didn't even know. I started coaching C-level when I was 21 years old. So nobody took me serious. Oh my gosh. And then on top of that, I studied in literally the opposite of what you would expect one of the top people in the industry to study in comms, which is accounting. I'm not supposed to be this expert but no. how did it become because I worked my tail off yeah. and I think if people just brought that mindset in real estate they'd be way more successful that's why you know since we're making this an advanced conversation you know for me the next level for somebody like you or somebody who's just as successful listening is not let's let's not be like great at this conference our goal this is how I coach people in real estate is the goal is not to be great the goal is to be the best speaker at the conference. So who do we need to be to be that person? And how much more money will we create? And in this industry, it is a lot of money. Okay, let's let's stop there and dive into that one. You knew you were going to get me with that one, right? <laughs> I wanted to talk about how do you how do you become the great speaker and not just an acceptable speaker? Uh, some of us, so um, I have a friend who's actually hosting this conference. And I said to him, good good thing we're good friends, Andrew, because he's just really brutally honest. But he said, he says, Miss Sharon, you are the stake all day long. Content is your thing. You are so good at that. But I am this, I am the sparkle. I am the one that gets up there. You know, I'm the uh, the really animated person up there. And all and that is true. Some of us are just we are who we are. We're not ever going to be, you know, that type of a speaker. It's it's not who we are at our core that just like him. But there is, and I noticed when I was, I really did stalk your YouTube channel. So one of the things on there you talked about was 
taking the way you speak, maybe improving upon that, but not trying to speak like someone else, because that always goes badly in the beginning. If you're, you have to be yourself whenever you're talking to someone, but is, are there some tips that you can give me for, and for everybody listening that will take you out of the average or acceptable and Obviously, know your topic, practice your talk, practice your presentation. There are the, those are a given. Is there something else though? I'm look. I'm still looking for that magic button, Brendan. For sure, for sure, Sharon. And and let me start with this. You know, I think the only reason I can go like to this deep is because you're such an open and vulnerable host. So thanks mm -hmm. for for sharing that space and creating that. And I think that's why a lot of people mm -hmm. resonate with who you are, Sharon. Right. So that's the first step which ties into celebrating the average, especially in real estate, because because average gets you a lot of great results. I mean, you come back every year, which I, I, I which I expected to hear from you. Right. The results are there. I'm, I'm showing up, Brendan. I'm getting a lot of referrals. And that's just the type of industry that all of you are in, especially if you're really good at what you do, which that's the problem. So the second step is is to do something that nobody on this podcast has done just from experience of coaching so many people in mm -hmm. this space which is really to take down and write down a communication manifesto if i could be or if i could communicate assuming it was possible mm -hmm. if i could give a simon sinek a tony robbins whoever that person a brene brown like talk in the context of my own real estate expertise whether it's cap tables whether it's appreciation of the property whether it's you know, what you're doing in probates, mm -hmm. hard money lending, how to raise that type of capital. If I could be that person, but in this industry, what income, freedom, and impact could I create in this space? What income, freedom, and impact could I create in this space? And have that person write that down on a page. Because that's mm -hmm. what gets us excited about the results. Because the problem we have in real estate, especially with the successful ones, by the way, the one that it's actually more problematic that the people are successful is the money comes too easy now because of the referral thing. Because they just get so many referrals that even if they're average, they show up, they'll still make a bunch of money. They'll still do really well. And they go, oh, I don't need to do better than this. I don't need to push harder. And that's why they get stuck at the level that they're at, I found. Mm -hmm. And then the last step is to go, okay, what are some of the gaps between where we are today and who we can be tomorrow? There's so many areas you can go into this, Sharon, but I'll give you kind of one consistent thing that I see a lot in this space, which is usually the introduction and the closing of a speech in real estate is so bad. It's so bad. They'll get up on a stage and they'll say, hi, everyone. You know, my name's Brendan and I've specialized in hard money lending for the last 10 years. And I'm going to teach all of you. Like, it's very basic. And then the ending of the presentation is the same. Yeah, you know, if you have any questions for me, you can let me know versus like telling personal stories about what got you into this space. Tell us a little bit more about you. What was your upbringing like? What were the challenges that you had? What got you so excited about probates? Why do you feel that you want to teach this to the whole world? And the ending becomes not just a thank you, any questions versus Talk about your vision. What is the vision for your business? What is the vision for what you want to create for the podcast? What type of education do you want to bring for the world? Not just at this conference, but beyond for the entire industry. And if we start to really dip our toes into those areas of a talk, you can really stand out in this space. I believe that a lot of people race through the intro, even with their personal experience, that they feel like they don't care about it. Uh, they've heard this before. Uh, I'm here to teach them something, but yet I'm going to focus on me. And I know that uh, when you're doing webinars, this is a time when I see people just wham, bam, get through that. You don't, you don't spill out your credibility, which leads to sales or, or no sales. You have to do that, but it is sometimes hard to do that on a stage. But that's interesting. I like that with the ending because so many times we do end that way. Uh, you know, I hope, hope you found this valuable or um, something like get here's my freebie or here's my website and then you're done. So on a good, if you're speaking, let's say you're giving a 45 minute to an hour uh, speech how much time should you spend on ending that speech with in mind that it could be as long as you want if you're hosting the event, but your host, if you're attending an event, may want it shorter rather than 
really drawn out. For sure, for sure, Sharon. So, so here's the idea. You know, the first thing that we have to change in this is the frame. So the frame just means, you know, as speakers, we tend to make up stories about what the organizer wants or doesn't want from us. Oh, okay, uh, this person wants me to, okay, yes, we can agree on the talk has to be 45 minutes. Fair enough. But beyond that, the organizer isn't going to be, you know, half, half in the roots about, oh, you know, Sharon, your, in your conclusion better be two minutes and a half or I'll get really mad at you. <laughs> they don't care. They're just grateful that you're mm -hmm. taking the time out of your busy schedule to even show up to the conference. My goodness, Sharon, you're the only person I know that's so good at probates. I'm so glad that you're here. I would have anybody as good as you to teach this. So, so the first one is a shifting of the mindset, which mm -hmm. is it's an honor for you to, for them to have you speak there. I, I'm just using you as a placeholder. It could put anybody in that, in that same idea. That's the first piece. So in other words, what I'm saying is besides the time limit, you, everything else is up to you. How you share the ideas in a way that you think maximizes the value for the audience. Let's go to number two that you touched on. I'm so glad you did because it reminded me to counter really well. Why is that mentality of skipping through the personal story and going, yeah, I'm a real estate guy or a gal. I'm just here to teach people. Why is that wrong? I'll explain it because real estate content is really boring. Most people will never remember, even if you have all the right ideas, even if you sold like so many properties, you've done so many deals and you've had success, people will rarely remember the information that you share, but they'll always remember the stories attached to that person's mm -hmm. idea. So like in this whole conversation, I could pretty much bet the number one thing people remember has nothing to do with the random word exercise or the question drill. They'll just go, oh, like Sharon kept saying how Brendan has a gift of gab. I guess that wasn't the case because he has a broken <laughs> left arm that's crooked and he, and he grew up speaking a language he doesn't know and he lives mm -hmm. in his mom's basement mostly to take care of her. But that's really the key right it's that's what people remember and then they go oh now let me dive in deeper into his courses into his programs into who he is in the same way you kind of went through the youtube videos that's really the idea so if you skip over personal stories you're actually skipping over the most powerful technique that allows people to build credibility with you because what you're really doing at the end of the day and speaking sharon is you're bridging trust Mm -hmm. You're bridging trust and the fastest way to bridge trust from somebody that you never know could think about. You had no idea who I was maybe three weeks ago or a month ago to the personal story. That's what actually creates a bonding between two people who have never met in person. And that's really the power of the personal story that, to your point, is highly under leveraged in the real estate space. And then the third piece is to work on these things one at a time. So if I'm coaching somebody, it's not Sharon or Julia or John. These are the 18 mistakes that are preventing you from being successful. Even if 18 mistakes are being made, it's more a question of saying, how do we work on one of these individually so that we can build our confidence over time? So in the webinar example, which is in super easy fix, let's just focus on the personal story. Present mm -hmm. that personal story 10 times back to me and let's really refine it. And just doing that alone will really improve your conversions or at least the number of raving fans that you have in the space that a lot of people in this industry don't think enough about, I found. That is great information. I know that people will often forget your business. I always tell people to build a personal brand. And they'll remember, they'll remember what you said to them if you are, have a compelling enough story. Even if they forget your name, they may have to look that up, but they will always remember a story, a compelling story. And I think for most of us, we lack good storytelling techniques. Uh, Donald Miller, of course, is the, he is, I think, the king of you know, this whole story brand thing. But people don't get invested in business names and in businesses. They get invested in the whole history and the story and, the, and oftentimes the deeper purpose, like one of them you mentioned in one of your videos that I watched with the water. People love to know where it all started and what the bigger vision is. So to end a presentation with the vision is actually a very excellent idea that never really occurred to me. So thank you for that. 
first? For someone that's not a pro like you, I, you have nailed down. I don't want folks to go, go to his YouTube channel, but don't get scared off. Just listen to him. He's so good at things like the intros. And I was listening to the different intros that you did. And they're very much what I've heard a lot of the top-notch speakers that anyone would recognize starts off with. Yeah, you've worked with real estate investors a lot. So how can you reframe that maybe a little bit? Make me make it a little simpler for uh, the average real estate investor. Do you know you know what I'm talking about? The what? the beautiful intros that you did. Absolutely, sure. So so there's there's two lines of thought that I have, but feel free to follow up on that. The first one is if you're a real estate investor raising capital for a fund, which might not be a lot of people here because since you're raising for single family mostly. Most of those people are multi, I found. And then the second, the second piece is if you're giving like a like a keynote type presentation where you're sharing your story, you're talking about, you know, your subject matter expertise at an industry conference. So the introductions you give in both contexts are really different. So the first one, when you're raising capital at like a family office or a general LP or or another real estate investor. You're starting your presentation, not with like a personal story or anything like that. You go straight into the deal, but you milk the deal. So that means you really sell the property that you're raising capital mm -hmm. for. So the typical example I've seen, I'm not, I'm not as good with single family. So I'll use a multifamily example. Let's say you're raising like a $10 million apartment building or a $50 million apartment building. You're really selling the location. And that applies to single family too, right? You're selling the number of doors mm -hmm. there, how profitable the, 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 the property is cash flowed, what the history of the property is. Just every part of it that's really exciting for a potential buyer so that they look at it and they say, okay, I want to invest my funds into this one and do a capital raise here instead of another property that I'm talking to on Tuesday. So it's really focusing the story around the building or the properties you're, you're thinking about investing and in, what your pipeline is essentially okay. and track record. But in a, in a, in a keynote format, or a webinar format where you're sharing your story, I would say the intro is largely going to be around your personal story. So like okay. when I start with my webinars that I do every two weeks for free, what I do on those webinars, I, it's the same presentation, but I start with my personal story. My, my intro just starts, I'll give it to you. You know, everybody on this call, there's like, let's say 70 of them. And I go, you think I'm some superhero of communication. And this is me pretending to be like one when I was three years old. And you have a picture of me on, on top of my uncle's car like this. And then I go, I was anything but a superhero. And I tell my personal story. So that's what I recommend for that type of context. That's excellent. I have found over time that people... You want them to feel like they're just like you, like they can do it. You did it so they can do it. And I've always been a big believer in sharing the good, bad, and the ugly, much like you talked about your crooked arm. If something just is, then there's no hiding it. So you may as well just make it the focus of the story or make it a part of the story. Wouldn't you agree? I absolutely, Sharon, right? I, I, I'm a big believer in what you said, which is, it turns out that the more you share about your life, you know, more personally, nobody can hit anything against you. Nobody has anything to attack you with. So the people who resonate the most with your message are even more inclined. And actually, you demonstrated this really well throughout the episode, because most of the times when I'm on a real estate podcast, the host never talks about their own weaknesses, right? Mm -hmm. They generally just focus on, you know, okay, like, let's just move on to the next question. Where you today, you actually went really deep on saying, hey, you know, Brent, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. But because of that, there's an unintended, very strong benefit to you, which is the people around you, the people who are listening to your community become very loyal. To, to listening to you specifically versus other people who might be doing similar things. And the same is true with me because I've, I'm not as vulnerable as I need to be on YouTube, honestly. I'm, I, think a little, I think I'm a little cookie cutter on YouTube, but on the other platforms, I do a much better job at being more vulnerable. So people who are, let's say, younger than me in my age group who might be C-levels or VPs, they'll look up to me and say, wow, this look at what this person has done in their 20s. I really look up to Brendan. I want to follow this person's mm -hmm. journey. And that's what vulnerability ability gives us access to i think in some ways it's the key to the kingdom as far as connections and 
uh, really, really connecting with people. I think it, I think it is so important. You, so many people look at the Instagram life and they think everything is perfect and everything is always good and hunky dory when it's not. And people have to learn to accept there will be challenges. You will be asked to get out of your comfort zone pretty much every day if you're an entrepreneur because you're never done learning. Therefore, you're always trying to step up or step over here. Otherwise, you just, your business will die. You have to become that person. I like that you talk about who do you have to become because for entrepreneurs, I think they have to become somebody different all the time. They have to add another layer to themselves to the point where we don't even remember when we didn't have all the layers. We've, we've added them a little bit at, at a time. So I think that's important for everybody to understand. Did you have anything to add to that, Brendan? I, I love that, Sharon. And and I got that from one of my coaches, Steve Hardison, which is really comes down to, you know, who do you need to be to mm -hmm. be that person? So for me, it was more of a question of, okay, if I want to be a better communication coach, what do I need to do? Same thing in real estate. If I want to be the X person in my industry, the go-to resource, the number one resource, what do I need to change in my daily habits and routines from a comms perspective to get the results that I actually want to drive? And when we really start to look in the mirror in the same way we do with the other areas of our business, but for communication specifically, that's when the magic really starts to happen in our in the results that we drive for, for clients and beyond. This has been such a great presentation. Folks are going to take away so many things. <clears throat> Pardon me. The allergies are bad. Do you have any final tips or advice? Yeah. <clears throat> for sure, Sharon. First of all, it's such a blessing to be on your show. Thanks for having me. In terms of the final thoughts, I'd leave with a question. And the question is simply this. How would your life change if you became an exceptional communicator? You know, I think the problem I've had with, with comms in general is a lot of it's associated to it being a chore or being negative or fear driven. Whereas my perspective has always been, wait a second, how would your life be better? How would the lives of the people around you be better? Yeah, I know today we focused a lot on real estate, but communication is so much more than just selling a property to a to a you know to to different people in the ecosystem. It's the way you take care of your family. It's the way you raise your children. It's the way that you make friends. It's the way that you go to conferences and meet cool people and build long lasting relationships. Mm -hmm. So I encourage all of you today to really reflect on that question because the answer to that question is what will actually motivate you to implement a lot of the exercises and strategies we talked about today. Excellent advice. Well, Brendan, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. <clears throat> what's the best way for folks to get in touch with you? And I will put all your links below, but what what's the best way if they have questions? For sure, Sharon. So two ways to keep in touch. The first one is to attend one of our free communication workshops over Zoom. I do one every two weeks. It's absolutely free and I facilitate the call myself. So if you want to see me actually apply a lot of these tips, the, starting with the personal story, you want to see me tell the personal story and whatnot, go to rockstarcommunicator.com and just sign up for our next workshop. That's the first way. And the second way to keep in touch is, of course, feel free to check out the YouTube channel, which is Master Talk in One Word. And it's awesome, folks. I, it really is. So thanks again, Brendan. And um, I will put all of the links uh, to all of his social media platforms and his website. And be sure to check him out because there is not a person on the planet that won't make more money, that won't benefit from learning how to be a great communicator, no matter what your business is. And for real estate investors who might think they don't need this skill, I'm here to tell you, you do need this skill. So thanks, Brendan. Thanks again to all the listeners for tuning in today. And I would love it if you would leave us a rating and a review. I will see you same time, same place next week. Bye for now.